It's wonderful to see all of you back, and for those of you who are new, welcome. Uh, we are going to start off, as Richard said, our, seri our seven-week series with three weeks on atoms, quarks, and strings, the origin of matter. And the first week, that's this week, I'm going to tell you about everything from atoms to quarks. We're going to start with things that all of you know about atoms, and we're going to end up with something that many of you have probably heard about, namely quarks. And next week, we're going to talk about the standard model, which is the most successful uh, model in modern science. It's been tested to 12 digits, 12 decimal places, parts in a trillion. Uh, and it describes how those quarks and all the other particles interact with each other. And then in the third week, um, and that's going to be uh, Professor Cyrus Taylor, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and the Michelson Professor of Physics. And then in our third week, we're going to talk about uh, things beyond the standard model, speculative ideas about physics. And somewhere in there, we'll end up talking about the Large Hadron Collider. So let's, let's jump right into it. And the way we're going to work it is, for, for those of you who are coming back, you know, I'll talk for about 15 minutes. And then after 15 minutes, we'll have some questions. And then go back to the talk for another 15 minutes, have some more time for questions, and finish it off with the third, third part. OK, so what are we going to do today? We're going to start with the periodic table. And since we're in the chemistry building, I was wondering if there'd be a periodic table on the wall somewhere. I'm sure we could find one. Um, but we'll see what it looks like. And we're going to go from there to the modern atom. And then we'll have some questions. Then we're going to take a little detour from our main story, uh, which is uh, we're going to look in the mirror. And we're going to see how nature can tell us when we are looking in a mirror, which is kind of surprising. And in the third part, we're going to talk about quarks and leptons, the building blocks of matter. So let's start out with the periodic table. I bet most of you have seen this. Maybe it's been a couple of years. But what this is is a table of all of the known chemical elements. Okay? And they are lined up. All the columns are things that have very similar chemistry. As we go down, they get heavier. But in each column, those have similar chemistry and those have similar chemistry. The creation of this table in 1869 by uh, this fellow, Dmitry Mendeleev, was, was really a revolution in understanding how to put what were then the fundamental particles of nature together to organize them. Okay? So he didn't know about all of them. A lot of them, so many of them weren't discovered yet. You can see all these ones that I blocked out in gray. They weren't discovered. Uh, these ones here in orange, in orange, we'll talk about in a minute, and as well as those ones in yellow. So, but all of these he organized in this way that allowed us to understand their chemical relationships, how the, how the chemistry of fluorine and chlorine were similar, the chemistry of oxygen and sulfur, et cetera. Now, these ones in this last column, those are what are called the Nobel gases. They weren't very reactive. We didn't know much about them. In fact, the first one, the top right, that's helium. And uh, it was discovered uh, only in 1868 which is the year before Mendeleev uh, did this. But I guess communications back then were maybe a little slow. People weren't quite sure about it yet. And it also wasn't widely accepted. So he didn't have that in his table yet. Um, argon, this, uh, this next this one two down, that, there had been hints of that since the 18th century. Um, but it wasn't actually isolated until about 30 year, 25 years later. And the other ones. Argon, krypton, so neon, krypton, and xenon, those didn't come around until almost the turn of the 20th century. Uh, those three, the four yellow ones, Mendeleev was actually able to predict their existence, and they were, they were very quickly found. Okay? And over the next uh, decades, all of these others were, were produced. Okay, some of them we are only made artificially. Many of the ones down here, they don't exist in nature, and we, we make them in accelerators. So this was the view of what were really fundamental particles. We didn't know that these had, you know, what these, that these were made of things. They were just fundamental elements. That started to change with the work of this fellow. This is Ernest Rutherford. 
And last year was the uh, centenary of probably his most famous experiment. He's considered the father of nuclear physics. And he had, back then, you know, he had a, a large laboratory. Actually, he had done some important work uh, in, in Montreal at McGill University. He had figured out how to make beams of, the, uh, of alpha particles, uh, basically helium atoms stripped of their electrons. And he had two of his, uh, one of his uh, research associates and one of his students uh, the inventor of the Geiger counter, Hans Geiger, and he had them shoot alpha particles at gold foil. Okay. Here are those folks, Hans Geiger and, and the fellow who later became Sir Ernest Marsden, so they became very eminent physicists. Uh, what did we expect? Well, what we expected is that when you sh shot those alpha particles at the gold, they kind of just go straight through. So here are the alpha particles going through the gold atoms. We kind of expected, we, we kind of thought that atoms consisted of electrons maybe embedded in some sort of positive matrix, and you could just shoot these alpha particles straight through. But that's not what we saw as hinted at in this picture, well, as shown in this picture. What did we actually see? We saw that some of, many of the alpha particles went through the, through the, great, uh, the gold foil, but a lot of them got deflected a little bit off that main path. So they came out of the alpha particle emitter over here, they hit the gold foil and they got deflected. And very occasionally, one would bounce back almost perfectly. Okay? So instead of going straight through, many of them went straight through, some got deflected, and some seemed to bounce straight back. And it took a couple of years for Rutherford to figure out what was happening there. What he realized was happening eventually was that there was a very dense positive nucleus inside the atom and then diffuse negative electrons kind of orbiting around that positive nucleus. Okay. So all of a sudden those elements now have different parts. They have nuclei and they have electrons. Okay. Now, that was still a situation in which there seemed to be, well, at the time, you know, tens of fundamental particles in the universe, that each one had different properties. Fun each one had a different nucleus, okay, with no particular relationship to each other in terms of one being made of another. Okay. Um, and that started to get even worse in the early part of the 20th century. So in 1912, this uh, radio chemist, Frederick Soddy, he noticed that between, between lead and uranium, where there should only be nine different nuclei, there were instead 40 different nuclei that he could measure by looking at the decay of the uranium and the, and the various elements in here. So instead of nine, 40. Okay. And a fellow named J.J. Thompson, who won the 1906 Nobel Prize in Physics, he noticed that neon, there were actually two different types of neon with different masses. Okay. And by the 1920s, there were more than 200 different models, sorry, different, different nuclei. Okay. So far more than were, uh, than were originally thought. Okay. Now, Today, if we look at the same, what's called chart of the nucleides, there aren't 200. In fact, there are about 4,100. Okay. So for each of those different elements in the periodic table, there could be several, you know, even you know, up to 10 different isotopes uh, of those, of those uh, elements. So that was really a pretty bad situation to have 4,100 different elementary particles. It didn't seem like we were really understanding what was going on inside the atom. And so the same fellow Rutherford, he started to probe the atom. So what he did is he took some nitrogen uh, atoms and he shot some more of these alpha particles, these helium nuclei at them. And what he noticed was that when he shot alpha particles at nitrogen, he got oxygen, but he got the nuclei of hydrogen, protons. 
Okay, so again, what we're showing here is a nitrogen nucleus and it's being hit by an alpha particle, which is a nucleus of a helium atom. And what comes out is something bigger and then this little thing and that's the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. In other words, it's what we call a proton. And so he said, well, I could build all of those different elements, all of those different chemical elements and all the different isotopes if I took, if different numbers of protons, okay, so d depending on how many protons there are, that's which element it would be. So that's where it would live in the periodic table. But then I could add different amounts of neutral particles. Now, no one had ever seen such neutral particles, so he predicted them. He said, well, there must be neutral particles whose mass is comparable to the mass of the proton. Uh, those are neutrons, and depending on how many of those exactly you have, that will determine which isotope of that chemical element you have. Okay, so now we have the number of protons inside your nucleus tells you which element you have, and the number of neutrons tell you, tells you which isotope you have, um, but we haven't seen these neutrons yet, and in fact, it was a dozen years before this fellow, Sir James Chadwick, detected those neutrons, and indeed, they were no neutral and about the mass of a proton. Um, by the way, he was awarded the, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics for discovering the neutron. Uh, he was also the primary British scientist who collaborated on the Manhattan Project during World War II. So, um, so that meant that by 1932, you know, sort of going into World War II, our world was all of a sudden much, much simpler. Right? We had started with this pretty complicated, it was a great revolution to be able to organize all these elements into the periodic table, but it was pretty complicated. It had a lot of different particles and things were only getting worse with the discovery of isotopes. But by 1932, it seemed like there were just three fundamental particles of nature. The proton, which was positive and heavy. The neutron, which was neutral and heavy, just like the proton, and the electron, which was negative and much, in fact, about 2,000 times lighter than the proton or neutron. And so everything was made of those. Atoms consisted of dense nuclei containing protons and neutrons and surrounded by these electrons. And the number of electrons, which was equal to the number of protons, determined the chemistry of the element. And in fact, all of ordinary matter is made of these three particles. Do we have to do something um, artificial to create those isotopes? Yes, we, so those, um, some, of those, uh, some of those isotopes exist naturally. Okay, many of those, like most of those isotopes exist naturally. Uh, so they, they're just, you can have a certain number of protons and then you can have, you know, a typical isotope will have about the same number of neutrons as protons, not exactly, but you can have one more, one less, and it can still be stable, or sometimes it's unstable, and it's, that means it's radioactive, okay? So it'll, it'll decay into other things, either by emitting alpha particles, by emitting the nuclei of helium, or by emitting electrons, or by emitting other particles. So we'll have radiation coming out of the unstable ones, but many, many of them are stable. Some of the higher ones uh, in that list those are only made in, in accelerators by smashing particles together. Some of, some of those isotopes only exist for a very short fraction of a, of a second. Judging by these three lords, why was so much of this fundamental research done in England? Well, remember that, uh, for example, the first important scientific experiment in the United States was done here, uh, what, about 125 years ago. Until then, really, you know, really until, the early 1900s, uh, the center of gravity for most science was, was, was in Europe, and really, uh, really until World War II, or just before World War II when a lot of scientists started to come over. Um, but really, Europe was the center for, for research, and uh, in particular, I'd say Germany and England in this field were, were really the places where a lot of the fundamental science was being done. Uh, Rutherford was actually up in Montreal for a lot of his early work, but as soon as he could get a good position in, in England, in Manchester, he went, he went over there. How did Rutherford, did he, what, what did he know about the uh, nature of alpha particles, their constituency?
That's a good question. I actually don't know. I'm not sure. I, I think he knew that they were, they, you know, I think he got them from helium. Okay, so we've now found we have these three fundamental particles, but now we're going to take a detour and we're going to look in the mirror. Yeah. And I'll, I'll try to explain what that means in a few minutes. So by the 1920s, this fellow, who was one of the most influential scientists of the 20th century, Niels Bohr, had told us, um, oh, he, by the way, he's a Danish physicist and won the Nobel Prize in 1922, really for uh, getting quantum mechanics going. Okay? So, but one of the ways he got quantum mechanics going was telling us that electrons orbit nuclei in a discrete set of possible orbits. In other words, unlike in the solar system where you could have a body orbiting pretty much any distance from the sun, in an atom you had to have your, your electrons orbiting on particular orbits. That's called the Bohr model of the atom. And that orbiting gave rise to magnetic fields. When you have charged particles moving, creating currents, those currents create magnetic fields, and you could measure those magnetic fields. It turned out when we measured those the magnetic fields, they didn't account for all the magnetic field, the motion of the electrons didn't account for all the magnetic fields we saw. And so we realized that the electrons had to have intrinsic magnetic fields. And a way to think of that is that the electrons not only were orbiting the nuclei, not only were they going around the atom, they were also spinning. That's, a cla that's what's called a classical picture of something quantum mechanical. They aren't really little spinning objects, but a convenient way for us to think of them is as spinning objects. Okay? And when they're spinning, that, that creates a current as well, and that current creates a magnetic field. So we could detect the magnetic field of these spinning electrons. So, and the magnetic, the, the electrons could spin in different directions, and we were able to detect that extra magnetic contribution. So the magnetic field could either add or subtract to the magnetic field uh, due to their motion, depending on whether they were spinning in such a way that it was uh, adding or subtracting. So um, I've drawn these little kind of orange arrows to suggest that the electrons are spinning either this way or this way. And if they're spinning this way, I, the way I figure this out is I take my right hand. If they're spinning this way, I'm going to put a little arrow the direction my thumb is pointing. And if they're spinning this way, I'm going to put an arrow down the way my thumb is pointing. Okay. So we, we say they, they're, they are either spin up or spin down. Now eventually, we realized that not only were the electrons, did they have spin, but so did the protons and so did the neutrons. And that those, that spin also meant that they had magnetic fields. So now we have electrons with spin and we have protons with spin and we have neutrons with spin. <clears throat> uh, and it turns out that when particles have spin, especially when they're moving fast, we can talk about them as being either right-handed or left-handed. Okay. We call a particle, for example, an electron right-handed if when it's spinning, that little, so it's spinning this way, the electron's spinning this way, its spin arrow is pointing that way. If it's also moving in that direction, we call it a right-handed electron. Okay? But if it's spinning the other way, this way, so that its spin arrow is pointing that way, so if its spin arrow is pointing to the left but it's moving to the right, we call it left-handed instead of right-handed. Okay? So electrons can be right-handed or they can be left-handed depending whether their spin is lined up or opposite to the direction they're moving. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> that is a property that changes when you look in a mirror. Most of physics does not change when we look in a mirror. For example, suppose I showed you a movie of pe people playing pool. And I asked you to tell me, did I take this movie directly with my camera or did I shoot into a mirror that was looking at the pool table? Well, if it's a really, really good mirror, there's almost no way that you could tell. The only way you could tell is, you, know, you might guess that it's in a mirror if all the players and all the audience were left-handed. 
But that's a peculiarity of biology that it manages to, manages to also ch to choose right-handedness over left-handedness. But in terms of the fundamental physics, the way the balls are bouncing, the way the balls hit the, you know, hit the walls, the way they fall into the pockets, you can't tell whether you're watching the movie or you're watching, uh, the, you're watching a movie of the game or you're watching a movie of a reflection of the game. Okay? And that's how we believed physics was. We believed the world didn't care whether you watched it through a mirror. Okay, well, let's look at these particles now, these right-handed and left-handed electrons in a mirror. So here I stuck a mirror down the middle, and here I have a right-handed electron. So that means it's, remember, it's spinning this way, and it's moving, that, moving to the right. Okay. But if I look in a mirror, then it's going to be moving towards the mirror still, and it's still going to be turning, spinning to the right. And if you're trying to think, is that right? Go home, look in the mirror, do something like this. So if I'm standing on this side of the mirror, I'm, if I turn my hands like this, then if you look at me in the mirror, my hands are still going around this way. Okay? But as I approach the mirror, I'm moving towards the mirror from this side, and my reflection is moving to you know, that, the other way. So you, the direction you're moving reverses, but the direction you're spinning doesn't. And that means that a right-handed electron, a right-handed particle, when viewed in a mirror, is a left-handed particle. Okay. It looks like a left-handed electron. And similarly, a left-handed electron looks like a right-handed electron we looked at in the mirror. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that if it's in fact true that right-handed and left-handed that we can't tell the difference when looking in a mirror, then right-handed and left-handed electrons should behave exactly the same. We shouldn't be able to tell the difference in how they behave. They should behave exactly the same. And so the question is, can we tell when we're watching a, a mirror image, when we watch how electrons behave? Now, this fellow, um, R.T. Cox, who was a professor, later professor of physics at Johns Hopkins, um, he decided that he was going to bounce some electrons, he was going to take some radium and he was going to bounce some electrons off of some mirrors and he was going to measure what happened to the electrons. So what did he do? He, he had some radium, this is in 1928, he had some radium which was an electron source and he would shoot electrons out, bounce them off a mirror, bounce them up here and sometimes he would aim this mirror over to this direction, and sometimes he would flip it and aim it off this direction, and he would count how many of the electrons actually managed to get into this particle counter that he had over there. You know, some of them would get up there and some of them would go in and flash, make the particle counter flash, but some of them would miss. Okay? And so he would do this, shoot the electrons out of the electron source, they'd bounce off the mirror, and some of them would get in, but some of them would actually miss. And he would do this over and over again you know, many, many, many times, okay? And then after a while, well, he would flip the mirror and do it some more, and some of them would hit and some of them would miss, but when they hit, they would flash. Now, the peculiar thing was that the electrons more often hit, even though he let the same number of electrons come out of the radium source, the electron, when he f had the mirror pointing to the right, the electrons hit more often than when he had the mirror pointing to the left. Okay. So electrons would go right more often than they would go left. Okay. In other words, you could tell this wasn't, you could tell whether you ha were looking at this in a mirror because the right hand part of the experiment was behaving different than the left hand part. He did it over and over again and other people did it. And the people who did it with a radium source got the same answer and other people did it instead of with a radium source. They boiled electrons off a of filament and it didn't work. So no one believed them. And people ignored the experiment for 30 years. Okay. Um, actually until these two folks repeated it, uh, well, actually, they did a different experiment, uh, but saw the same thing. This is uh, Madame Wu, C.S. Wu, uh, and she was actually the only Chinese physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project. Uh, and the fellow to the right is Richard Garwin, who was born here in Cleveland in 1928 and graduated from Case Institute of Technology in 1947. And he also did an experiment like this. And what they found was 
that nature indeed can tell the difference between left and right. That nature, when viewed through a mirror, is not the same. So all those people who were, did not believe that result from 1928 were wrong. It was a completely unexpected result. Our theory of physics hadn't allowed for that possibility, and so people just assumed that the experiment was wrong. And in fact, I, th I think most physicists, I just learned about this a couple of weeks ago. So most people have completely forgotten this experiment, but in fact, the, fa the, the, the fact that when we look in a mirror, we get a different answer for physics was discovered in 1928, not in 1957, which is what we always uh, credit, credit Wu and Garwin for. Um, and so it turns out that left-handed and right-handed electrons behave differently, and that radium was emitting more left-handed electrons than right-handed electrons because of the way that we'll learn next week that weak interactions work. When things decay, they emit left-handed electrons exclusively, not right-handed electrons. Okay. So nature knows the difference between left-handed electrons, left-handed particles, and right-handed particles. In fact, the thing we call an electron is actually two completely different particles. The left-handed electron, that thing that was spinning this way and traveling that way, is not at all related to the particle called the right-handed electron, which is spinning this way and moving that way. It's just that they can turn into one another by emitting another particle. We don't see that other particle. That particle is called the Higgs particle, and we're going to talk about that next week. You've probably heard about people looking for the Higgs. Okay. So our confusion about the, nature manages to relate the left and right-handed electron and make us fool us into thinking that there's only one particle, but there's actually two. And it was these two people who taught us this even though back in the year that he was born, we should have figured it out already. What's the so what? What are the implications What's of the this? What's the implications? Well, that's, that's a great question, so what? It'll turn out, so the first thing is it's surprising. Okay. So people had you know, studied physics by, at this point, studied science at this point for you know, doing this kind of science, detailed science for uh, maybe 100 years, and had no idea that this was possible, that, that looking in a mirror, you could that you could tell when you were looking in a mirror when doing science. But you could say, you're right, so what? It'll turn out that if that wasn't true, none of us would be here. Okay? It turns out that in order to make more matter, which is what we're made of, than this stuff called antimatter, which we need to stay far away from, because if we touch it, we'll get, to, we'll, we'll get destroyed. Um, you need this property. You need for there to be what's called parity violation. You need there to not be a symmetry between left and right-handed particles. They have to behave differently. Okay? So our existence actually relies on the fact that there's a difference between left and right. And we didn't appreciate that. Uh, and we actually didn't appreciate that until, about the, until the mid-1960s. A fellow named Sakharov, who many of you know as the father of the Russian hydrogen bomb, he was the one who pointed out that we needed this parity violation in order for, to make more matter than antimatter. Assuming you have a sodium uh, atom, <clears throat> do all sodium atoms have uh, left and right spins to the same degrees? Um, no, so this, pro this pro property of being left and right-handed, uh, it turns out that because of this Higgs field that we're, you know, that we're gonna talk about next time, in terms of the, that people are looking for the particles of now, uh, left and right get mixed up very easily. And that's why we never really, why we don't notice on a day-to-day -day basis that there's a difference between left and right in, in, doing, in chemistry and in, um, in an ordinary, normal particle physics. It's why it was so hard to really see. So in that sodium atom, those, ele those electrons, they flip between left and right constantly. Okay. In order to get them not to flip between left and right, they have to be going really, really close to the speed of light. Then it, that makes it harder for them to go fa not flip. So the electrons coming out of the radium were going fast enough that basically they di weren't flipping. They were coming out as left-handed electrons, and they were staying left-handed long enough that they knew whether that there was a difference between going left and right in the, in, in the, on the mirrors.
Okay? But inside the sodium atom, they're moving too slowly to preserve their left-handed or right-handed identities. Well, you answered my question. Uh, I was going to ask if there is hydrogen has both right hand and left hand. Same reason, and no. There's so no. There's no difference. No, there's no, there, there is no, the, the electrons inside of atoms actually move pretty slowly. What I mean by, what do I mean by slowly? They only move, you know, in a hydrogen atom, the electron's going about 1% of the speed of light. Uh, that's what we call slowly. Okay, so speed of light is the maximum speed. You, you know, it's as if, imagine that, you know, if, you, if you're driving on the freeway, you're driving at, you know, six, 60 miles an hour, maybe a little bit more, and someone's going along at half a mile an hour. What does half a mile an hour look like? That's like this. Right? That's pretty slow. Right? So electrons are moving really slowly compared to the speed that would be needed in order for them to preserve that, that, that handedness. And the same thing, the protons, as we'll learn in a minute, they're not even fundamental particles. So there isn't a, such a thing as a left-handed proton and a right-handed proton. It's sort of fun sometimes to try and think back how these guys were thinking when they do these experiments, and particularly when they make mistakes. And it uh, makes you wonder, there are two things in these experiments that were done by Wu and Garner. There's the particle, but then there's the deflector. Well, That's material. They, in fact, looked at it in a completely different way. They did a completely different experiment than Cox, actually. It's, a, it's, a, it's another piece of material right. that, whose structure and properties may explain either what we call them anomalous result or what turned out to be an important result. Right. Well, and I think it's also interesting how important a role theory, and ex theory plays in experiments. If you don't have a theory to explain your anomalous result, you think your result is wrong. So for example, you know, many of you, who, who here has heard about the neutrinos that go fast in the speed of light? Okay, so that was in the news a long, for a long time, that there were neutrinos that moved fast in the speed of light. And if you ask pretty much any physicist, he or she will tell you that that, result, that experiment is wrong. Okay. Now, in fact, it's turned out to be wrong. But even before we knew why it was wrong, because there were some bad cable connections, um, pretty much everyone was convinced it was wrong. Everyone was also convinced that Mr. Co you know, Dr. Cox's experiment was wrong, because there was no good theory to explain it. So we have to we have, to have a little bit of humility when, we, when we're so confident that, our, that, that, wrong, that what seem to be wrong experiments really are wrong. Sometimes they turn out to be right. So let's get back to our main story, and you'll see why our digression wasn't completely a digression, because we learned in our digression that those particles that we think of one particle, the electron, is really two different particles, the left-handed electron and the right-handed electron. But what I want to do now is talk about the case for quarks. So let's remember where we started, which was with this periodic table of the elements that, had, you know, that has over 100 what could have been fundamental particles, and how life got even worse when it turned into the chart of the nuclides with 4,100 fundamental particles, different isotopes, but how life got wonderfully simpler when we understood that really everything was made out of electrons and protons and neutrons. So that bef you know, going into World War II, going to the early 30s, we thought, we, we, we knew the fundamental constituents of matter, electrons, protons, and neutrons. And if we had listened to Cox, we would have realized that that the electrons, at least, were actually two different particles, but we didn't listen to them, we ignored them. So um, what happened, though, is that we very quickly realized that there are other particles. In fact, in 1928 through 1931, Dirac, a very famous physicist, and he, he won. Uh, so many of these people won the Nobel Prize for the work they're doing. There's probably a couple of tens of I mean, 20 or 30 Nobel Prizes uh, given out for, for this stuff. So I'm not always going to you know, mention when everyone won a Nobel Prize for it. But Dirac, um, he predicted that there was going to be another particle just like the electron, exactly the same mass, that could also spin left or right. but have a positive charge instead of a negative charge, just the opposite charge. And in 1932, uh, Carl Anderson, an American physicist, 
who won the 1936 Nobel Prize for this, discovered that indeed in cosmic rays, in particles coming from the sky, coming from outer space, he saw positively charged electrons, electrons that curved the wrong way in magnetic fields, but otherwise behaved exactly like electrons. So all of a sudden now we have not three fundamental particles, but four. Now that wasn't so bad. Uh, in fact, we'll see Dirac also predicted that there would be an antimatter version of the, of the proton, the antiproton, uh, but um, something bad happened. And, and that was that just a few years later, Anderson found another particle that was just like the electron, uh, except it was 200 times heavier. And as another one of the collection of people who won Nobel Prizes in this period said, um, who ordered that? <laughs> Nothing we knew on Earth was made of muons. In fact, muons decay in a tiny fraction of a second. But um, by the way, this fellow Robbie, he's the one who invented uh, MRI, although at the time it was called nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay? So that goes back to his, his Nobel Prize was in 1944. All right, so, so now we have the electron and the proton and the neutron. We've discovered antimatter, that's the positron. But now we have another copy of the electron, and that's the muon. And things are starting to get messy. Okay? Uh, and then this fellow, this, this uh, Japanese theorist, Yukawa, in 1935 said, you know what, we're going to need some particles to help mediate the force, to bind together protons and neutrons inside nuclei. Uh, and those are going to be called pions. Okay. And sure enough, in 1947, in, again in these cosmic rays coming from, from, uh, from outer space, he saw, well, we, we saw pions. All right, so now we have, that's called the pi plus and the pi minus. Those are the two pions. And um, a few years later, in an accelerator, the first particle produced uh, in an accelerator for the first time in 1950, we saw a neutral version of the pion, about the same mass, um, but no ch electric charge. And then, Oh, in, as I said, Dirac, had, just like he had predicted the positron, he predicted the antiproton. And in 1955, we managed to see that, okay, again in cosmic rays. And so here, let, let, me, uh, let me get rid of all those, uh, those circles and arrows and just put a chart up here. So there's now three basic types of particles. There are light particles. Those are called leptons. That means light particles. And heavy particles, those are called baryons. Uh, which means heavy particles. And there are particles of middling mass. Those are called mesons, which means middle, middling. Um, so now we have all of these fundamental particles. Uh, and then we start to get more. Actually, you should think of the, po the negative pion as the antiparticle of the positive pion, and the neutral one as its own antiparticle. Okay. Well, it kept getting worse and worse. We, in 1947 to 1950, we found four new mesons called the K plus, the K zero, the K minus, and the antiparticle of the K zero called the K zero bar. The plus means it's positively charged, the minus negatively charged, and the zero uncharged. And another heavy, another baryon, another heavy particle called the lambda zero. Um, and these were strange. Uh, in that they decayed more slowly than we expected to. So we uh, named a property called strangeness, uh, which explained why they were strange. <laughs> and um, it kept going uh, in, uh, in 1951 through 1954 in Chicago. Enrico Fermi, the famous Italian-American physicist, another Nobel Prize winner, um, he, he, he made four new baryons, the, delta, the deltas. And uh, then in uh, 1952, in cosmic rays, we saw three more. And then in 1959, the final one of these, what are called cascade particles, so four new baryons. And uh, in 1930, Pauli predicted that the electron should have a partner called the neutrino that would be neutral and very hard to see, and it was. But in 1956, Cowan and Rhinus uh, at a nuclear reactor managed to detect neutrinos. Okay. Uh, at the t uh, that was in 1956. 
Uh, Rhinus, they of course won the Nobel Prize. Well, uh, Rhinus did much, much later in 1995, I believe. Go read the plaque. And you can go read the plaque out there, right? Because he was chair of the physics department here from 1959 to 1966. Okay? And he won his Nobel Prize in 1995. Okay, so you notice that there, we're getting a lot of new particles. Uh, in 1962, Leon Letterman noticed that there, was actually, there were actually two different types of neutrinos, these incredibly hard to find particles that we could only see in nuclear reactors. Um, there was one called the muon neutrino, or that's what we named it. And so really an awful lot of different particles. Okay. Uh, and yeah, 1960 to 61, we added some more mesons. So this is kind of, kind of a lot of, uh, of particles to have. Remember, we, we had this nice picture of electrons, pro protons, and neutrons, and now we have this whole mess. And it really only gets worse, because um, here are the leptons. There were six of them now. Actually, by that point, we, we actually didn't know about the tau and the new the tau minus, another copy of the lepton. We'll learn about that. We would have learned about that later. Um, this doesn't look so bad, the lep these four leptons and their anti-leptons. But um, here is the list of all the mesons and baryons that we know about. Okay. It doesn't look a whole lot simpler than that. It looks worse than the periodic table because it's just a list. They're not even organized. And it almost looks as bad as that chart of the nuclei. nuclei. Again, since this is just a list, it's probably even worse. So as Enrico Fermi, who's already come up, said to Leon Letterman, young man, if I could remember the names of these particles, I would have been a botanist. Okay. So it was a mess again. And um, I imagine it was a very disturbing time to be a particle physicist because the point of being a particle physicist was to investigate the fundamental particles of nature, the fundamental forces between them. And here you have this absolute zoo with no relationship between these particles. Every, you know, every week someone discovers another one and you, you just add it to your list. And it was really fundamentally this fellow, Murray Gell-Mann, uh, an American physicist who won his Nobel Prize in 1969 uh, for the work I'm going to describe, along with an, an, a bunch of other people, but it was really primarily him. Here are some of the others. Uh, unfortunately, they're coming off the bottom of the screen, but uh, Kazuku Nishima, who is a Japanese physicist, Yuval Ne'eman, an Israeli physicist, and this fellow George Zweig, who, um, who now works somewhere on Wall Street. So Gelman had the revolutionary idea that all of those mesons and baryons aren't fundamental particles. It's not really that revolutionary. If you think going back to that, what we had learned from history about the periodic table and you know, nuclear atoms and nuclear nuclides, when you end up with a lot of stuff, maybe they aren't really fundamental. Maybe they're made of things. And so his idea was that these baryons, neutrons and protons and all those others, and those mesons, the pions and all those others, are composite. In other words, they're made of more fundamental things. <clears throat> so this is the model he built of a baryon, like a neutron or proton. He said, there are three quarks. Why quarks? Well, because he was reading Finnegan's Wake, and there's a line in Finnegan's Wake, three quarks for Mr. March, and he liked that because he liked the sound of it, he said. And he liked the number that it had the number three, and he needed three of them, so he decided to name them quarks. And there are many, many stories talk, told about this fellow Marie Gelman, none of which I'll tell on camera, um, but I'm happy to tell them some of them afterwards. But um, it's very much in keeping with his personality to go off and name something for a line from Finnegan's Wake. Okay. So, three quarks, he said, and they're going to have <coughs> spin, just like electrons to do. And, and so, for example, if we put three of them together, if two of them are spinning one way and the other the opposite way, that'll up, add up to give the spin of a baryon like the proton. Uh, we're going to give them some charge, and we can give them a charge in such a way that we're going to get protons and neutrons. How do we do that? Well, we'll say our ordinary baryons, the proton and neutron, are going to be made of two what are called flavors of quark, up and down. Okay. That's just the names he gave them. Uh, 
A proton is going to be made of two up quarks and one down quark. And if we let up quarks have charge plus two thirds and down quarks have charge minus a third, then two thirds plus two thirds is four thirds and four thirds minus one third is three thirds and three thirds is one. So protons have charge one. And a neutron is going to be made of an up quark and two down quarks. And so that's two thirds minus a third minus a third and that's zero. And now we know why protons are charge one and neutrons are charge zero. Um, now, that doesn't sound so remarkable, but remember he had to explain not just the proton and the neutron, but all of those other baryons and all of those mesons. And his explanation for mesons is pretty simple. A meson, like a pion, those are made of a quark and an antiquark. So here is a picture of a, a positive pion. It's just an up quark bound to an anti-down quark. So that's two thirds and a down quark is minus a third. So an anti down is plus a third and two thirds plus one third is one. That's a positive pion. And a negative pion is an anti up quark plus a down quark and that's minus two thirds minus one third and that's minus one. And so he could now build baryons like protons and neutrons and mesons like pions out of his quarks and anti quarks. And remember there was a neutral pion. Well, that's say an up quark and an anti up quark and those add up to zero or a down quark and an anti down quark and those also add up to zero and it turns out that the neutral pion is kind of a mixture of those two things. Okay. And in fact, he could explain all the baryons. Well, he had to add a third flavor of quark and here's where that strangeness comes in. He called it the strange quark. And once he had done that, he could make all of the baryons and mesons that we saw. So our new list of fundamental particles is once again much shorter. Here they are, the electron and its neutrino, the muon and its neutrino, and three types of quarks. That's not too bad, that's seven, and then of course they're antiparticles, but still, that's relatively, you know, tiny. You know, it's much better than that huge list that we came up with. Well, things don't stay simple. Uh, it was quickly realized that you actually couldn't just have that strange quark. You needed another quark. Uh, this was noticed by three folks named Glashow, Iliopoulos, and Mayani. They invented something called the Jim mechanism for their names. Uh, and they said, said in 1970, they said, you're going to go out and you're going to find another quark. It's, we're going to call it Charm. And that was discovered in 1974 by Bert Richter and Sam Ting at Stanford and at Brookhaven. And guess what? They won the Nobel Prize. Um, and then some other folks said, oh, well, you actually need more quarks here. Uh, you're going to need uh, a bottom quark. Okay. And indeed, the bottom quark was predicted in 1973 and discovered in 1977. And then people said, well, you're also, go you know, you're also going to find uh, some more of these, another copy of the electron that's even more massive than the muon and its neutrino, and those were discovered in the mid 1970s. Remember what we learned about there being left and right? So, really, each of those quarks is not one quark, but two different one left and one right handed. Um, and each of those electron, muon, and tau, there's actually a left handed and a right handed one. Uh, and then this fellow by the name of Yuchiro Nambu, who, who I'm particularly proud of, he's actually my grandfather, not my real biological grandfather, my intellectual grandfather. He's the advisor of my advisor. Uh, he pointed out that we were actually going to need to take those quarks and we're going to have to make three different colors of each one. Okay. But let's ignore that for a while. We're going to talk about that next week. This really is the list of fundamental particles that make up all sorts of matter. The matter in this room is made only of these four and the two electrons. All of this stuff exists only in accelerators and out in space. Okay? So everything that we know and love is made on this side, not including the neutrino. Neutrinos kind of whiz through stuff. Okay? And they're held together by these 12 particles, 
that we're going to focus on next week. And by the last particle out of this zoo of 34 fundamental particles of the standard model that we have yet to find, but at which there are finally, after decades of looking, hints called the Higgs. So where did we start? We started at the periodic table as this great organizing principle derived from chemical knowledge that Mendeleev had. And we saw that the world get, got much, much messier before it got much, much neater. But it didn't stay neat. It got messy again. And we had this terrible list in the 1960s of things that we really had no understanding, just lists and lists of particles. And we've now managed to reduce it to at least a manageable number, 34 particles of the standard model. Now, you might be wondering, and this is what we'll talk about in the last week, does this suggest that there is more fundamental understanding, that we're ready one more time for a revolution in which we understand all of these particles to be different aspects of the same thing, composites or some other relationship to each other? But that has to week for two, wait for two weeks uh, from now. Next week, this fellow, Cyrus Taylor, is going to tell us about the standard model, the fundamental forces, and the origins of mass. And you'll have to wait for two weeks for physics beyond the standard model. Thank you.